makes sense. A very great morning to you humans. This is your boy, Dr. JC, AKA the dragon. And welcome to a special episode of the Make Sense with Dr. JC Dornick podcast. This particular uh, conversation is there's very, very many opinions and concepts out there about certain topics like suicide for one of them or corrupt police officers or PTSD and things like that. And, and those concepts are all based on the programming that we have from our life experience, you know? So whenever we create perceptions and concepts, when we hear a story, they always come from our own version of it that we're, you know, we're looking through our own lens. So that's why I want to take this topic of uh, making sense of men and mental health and the idea of like, how can we break free from this somehow culture created stigma you know, that has a tendency of belittling men. I mean, I know what it was like for me to grow up for being weak and, and, and having problems, you know, I mean, we're just so freaking stubborn men. So I want to welcome to, uh, the make sense podcast, uh, the amazing Kevin Donaldson. How are you, my friend? Dr. JC, you know, I didn't even know you were a doctor for a while and I, I have a few credits to go to get my ED, but the reason I don't do it is because i make my kids call me doctor. That's funny. I would just lead with that one because it automatically gives you credibility. You know, a lot of a lot of people ask me what they should call me. Like there's the dragon, there's JC, there's Dr. JC. And the and the whole doctor thing is funny. If I'm being completely honest, you know, it just probably makes me sound smart and cool. But the truth is, is that I really didn't ever really help people as a doctor. I started helping people once I released from that chain and and you know went out there in the world like like you're doing right now ironically right it's like you know did you help more people as a police officer or now as the your who you've become so yeah you can just i'll be i'll be ecstatic to you know, excited psyched to know that you're just calling me you know so that that'll be fun so so, I, like, I like the the name of your show right you, you brought up something in the beginning here yeah yeah making sense of this whole mental health post-traumatic stress things of that so making sense is you're trying to bring order out of chaos and men's mental health, especially when you're immersed in the problem itself is mm. absolute chaos. Just take a picture with a pen and draw all around that paper and just, just scribble. And that's what sort of goes on in, in especially men, because we're stubborn, we're idiots. We, we yeah. can be very tough to persuade when we want to be. It's, it's funny that you brought that up because the first thing that I was thinking about is and one of the problems that we face as men, and that has come from our mother, father, teacher, preacher, and then the way we were brought up, you know, and we're going to get into that with your story. If I hear somebody, if I hear a man say, hey, you know, the truth is, is that it's complete chaos and, it, and it, it's it's hard to make sense of it because there's so many variables. But I could easily introduce you to a guy that would tell you exactly what it is. <laughs> he would say, you know, men's health, that's for a bunch of pussies. Um, or somebody that says, yeah, we really need to work on that. So the truth is, is that whatever anybody thinks at the time that they think it and say it with an exclamation point at the end, they're right, but it doesn't mean it's right. You know, so when we, when we look to make sense of things like this topic that we're about to get into, what I like to do for my listeners is not sway them in a direction, you know, like your, your story is going to move in a direction to where you're at right now and how you're helping people. I'm not necessarily tethered to the idea that everybody agrees with us this, wherever we get, but I just want them to be exposed to looking at things from all angles. And, you know, this idea of watching the, the idiot box, as my grandfather would say, and just seeing what news shows you about police officers. Um, there's a very, just one concept right off the bat that I was going to ask you, but you've brought it up. You know, I mean, a lot of people would say like police officers are all a mess and they're corrupt and all they do is beat the crap out of people and all that stuff. But those people never really take the time to like say, I wonder why they're like that. So or we're, something. We're, every one of us, and I'm talking every single one of us, and I will say this with an exclamation point. Yeah. Whatever tribe, group, ethnicity, whatever you belong to, you're going to be judged by your lowest common denominator. Yeah, yeah. And the vast majority of, you know what? Everybody with glasses is a nerd. Well, Everybody with glasses is a nerd, right? That's because the person who said that knows one person yeah, yeah. with glasses who's a nerd. When people say cops are bad, it kind of makes my blood boil and it takes mm. away. From, 
It takes away from all the good that people do. I know a lot of cops throughout my career and post-career. Actually, I know more cops my post-career. And I will tell you with 100% certainty, 99.999% of them are good people. Do we have our boneheads? 100%. But in the field, in, in the doctor field, there are some bonehead doctors. Yeah, I know some boneheads. Who do God's work, who yeah. save lives, who are so committed to their craft. And that's why when a police officer goes bad or gets caught for going bad, it infuriates nobody in the world more than the other police because yeah. all it does is put a pockmark on us and the work that we're trying to accomplish. So I don't get mad at people when they say that. I understand that it comes from a from ignorance. But the great thing about ignorance is it can be educated. So I, I have this thing, right? So I abhor laziness. You know, I, I just abhor it because it's that's a virus, you know, and that's a if you don't if you don't cut that cancer out in the beginning, it will grow. A lot of people will say, you know, people who are ignorant. Well, ignorance can be educated. So we we can we can take our experiences. I have many people in my life who grew up in a in a in an urban neighborhood and they say, Yeah, well, we had a view of cops that wasn't very favorable. And then I met you and and not all cops are like that. And I said, Well, this one particular person is Puerto Rican. I said, Well, how would you like it if I said that that all Puerto Ricans were this type of person? Yeah. You know that's not true. And guess what? Those people who say those things, they also know that's not true. But their eyes are just focused on the one bad apple. That seems to get the most attention. The cops out there who are working day after day after day doing great work, they never get highlighted because it's not newsworthy. The idiot box is not telling us what to think. That's right. At the risk of getting completely off topic and having to do two episodes, you know, the the actual science behind what you're talking about is, you know, this this phenomenon of people labeling something, even if they inherently know that there's another side and it's not true. Forgive you for you know not what you do. That's just the way the brain works. We have this thing called cognitive bias. You see this in politic politics and religion right now where people just completely have the ability to completely shut out anything otherwise than what they've been raised to think and then only hang out with the right people and the things that validate what they think. So let's talk about, we're going to bring you all the way from where you've been to where you're at right now, where you're, you know, you've just authored this amazing book, uh, Man, Are You Crazy? And we'll, we'll, we'll get into that in the latter part. I think what's fascinating is just the whole idea. I'm always fascinated how people like, you know, synchronistically find their way to meeting people and find their way to careers. Um, and I've heard bits and pieces of this story. So take us back to your childhood, you know, where you grew up and and what that life was like, you know, what kind of a childhood and upbringing did you have? I, I grew up uh, very humbly. Most people would call it poor. I prefer to repurpose it and call it humble, but it, it, it never, things never resonated with me very well. Um, my surroundings were so chaotic. You talk about making order out of chaos. My surroundings were so chaotic. I watched certain people in the Atlantic City area in New Jersey. I watched certain people have, and I watched a lot of people have not. I was one of the have nots, but I watched how the people of the day, the haves, got what they got. And these were these were gangsters. So I grew up in the era era of the true corrupt. Atlantic City, the Scarfo era, you know, and, and, and I watched them. We knew who they were. Listen, they, they were normal guys. They were fathers. You know, we, we played baseball against their kids. We were friends with their kids. We knew who they were. We sort of just, they were just normal people. You know, they were just, they were just people trying to make a living. It wasn't any big deal, but we knew how they got what they got. Being a have not, if you grew up around me and you didn't nail it down, I was stealing it. I was going to take it from you. I had stolen everything from candy. You know, when I was a kid, the big thing was stealing condoms. Why? I was like 10 years old. I wasn't going to use them. But I would steal condoms because I thought it was cool. Candy. Um, and then I graduated to much larger items. I think the largest item I ever took was out of a pre-construction house. There was a hot tub in there. And we wiggled this hot tub out, threw it in the back of the truck, drove down the road with a hot tub. Now, again, there was no purpose behind it. What did, what, what were we doing? We're not going to sell it. We're not going to use it. We have no plumbing to hook it up. We just wanted to feel that win, 
you know, feel that, that, that good feeling. Cause we were all missing something at home. I was really missing something at home. I grew up around a monster who, you, you know, we talk about, you know, the, how you grew up and your views of how you grew up. I grew up in an incredibly racist household. Um, people of any other skin color other than white were not looked at very favorably. I, one of the things I, I always say that I, my father used to call me the laziest white man alive. And I never understood that. Like that, God, that, that one got me because I, I, I say, well, okay, well, I guess, you know, I'm a young kid. I really don't know the world. I guess people of all different ethnicities are just lazy. You know, they're just lazy people and white people aren't lazy, but see, here's the problem. And this comes with every walk of life. As you grow up and you start to see the hypocrisy in those words that were drilled into you as a kid, even, even basic racism, you know, black people are bad, white people are good. You'll start seeing that hypocrisy. Well, you know what? I know a lot of white people that are really bad. And I know a lot of black people that are really good. You start to question. And when you question one thing, when you see the, the falsehoods in those statements, now all of a sudden you start questioning everything they say, even the stuff that they say that's that's legitimate. So that's kind of what I did. And, you know, by the time I was 14 years old, I wasn't listening to anything. Right. Because I thought stuff that, that was coming out of his mouth was just was just was absolute nonsense. You know, there was there was an incident and it ble it bleeds out in children. It bleeds out in, in their everyday life. And it's funny because I just reconnected with this guy. Uh, I went to high school with this guy. He's black guy. And I remember I remember calling him the N word. Right. Right in the open wow. air of school. And his name's Leo. So I, I won't say his last name. I remember the look on his face. I remember the look on his face and it got me. It really hit home with me. And I, I kind of, you know, slumped my shoulders put my head down and I always felt really bad about it. Leo just contacted me and he's working on a project and he's, he's watching what I'm doing. So who was the bad guy in that situation? I was the bad guy. I was, a, I wasn't, I was turning into the same monster that I was growing up with and watching these guys or watching these gangsters. I was turning into them. So where's that going to end you? It's going to end you in jail uh, or it's going to end you dead or it's going to end you in some sort of trouble, but it's definitely not going in a direction that's going to, that's going to uh, bring any, any, any type of good production. Throughout my younger years, I was constantly looking for an identity. You know, I was constantly trying to find my place in this world. Yes, I had the street smarts. I did have the, the intellectual smarts as well. I did have the book smarts. Um, so I was able to eke my way through, but I'm still trying to find my, my way in this world. I was, I was a tough kid. I got into a lot of fights, but that was a lot of, of my programming from home. You know, mm -hmm. I, I grew up in a very, very abusive household and I sort of picked on the, the, the kid who I saw as less cause I was taking out my aggression. You know, one of the guys I've, I've recently reconnected with and he's become a very dear friend of mine. I bullied the hell out of this kid and then he left school and I always felt bad about it. But what it did was it transformed my way of thinking to, to always trying to protect the underdog. Uh, and it, it happened very, Shortly after he left school, uh, it took me 30 years to track that guy down. And with the advent of social media, I was able to get it. But his, his, I'll say his name because I love him dearly. His name's Jesus Aponte. Do you know how many Jesus Apontes there are in the world? <laughs> right. There's a ton. Yep. So I, I track him down. Turns out he's a cop. Oh, wow. And this guy, I call him on the phone for the first time. I was like, Jay, you, everybody called him Jay. I'm like, Jay, I'm, I'm really sorry. And he says, hey, listen, man, we were just kids. I forgive you. And I'm like, you son of a, can't you just like yell at me, to right. call me names, do That's something to make, me, to make me feel good. But no, this guy had the grace to forgive me. Jay is now one of my very good friends. I wasted a 40-year relationship with yeah. this guy, a 35-year relationship where so, this is somebody who I, sh I should have been close to. But I do break those generational curses. And I tell my kids that story about what a jerk their father was have to show that vulnerability to them so they don't fall into the same trap that I fall into. You know, they, they, they grow up, they've grown up much, much differently than, than I have. I got out of college. I, I switched my major to literature and I got out of college. I, so I figured, okay, I'm not going to be a pastor or a priest or anything or change my life that way. So, you know what, maybe I can, I can teach kids. Cause I did have a love. I still have a love for literature and I always will have a love for literature. And, uh, and, you know, towards the end of my college career, I sort of got it back together once again where I started looking at my future a little bit closer. And I graduated, um, I went to graduate school, and I started teaching high school. Uh, I started teaching high school English. I didn't know that. So we were reading The Marriage of Heaven and Hell by uh, William Blake. And in The Marriage of Heaven and Hell, there's something called The Proverbs of Hell. 
it's little pieces of advice that were written 500 years ago that would be applicable to today. Like the cutworm forgives the plow. The busy bee has no time for sorrow. So those, those little things. And I had these two seniors in the back and I give this, I give this assignment out and it says, you know, if you could write a piece of advice that would be valid 400 years in the future, what do you think it would be? And most people did their best, but it's a tall order. I was a brand new teacher. It's a tall order for high school seniors. I had one kid in the back say, if you shake more than twice, you're playing with yourself. And the other one wrote, if you play with it, you'll go blind. They followed the rules. That's funny. <laughs> yeah. Now I'm, I'm 22 years old and I'm looking at them. I'm like, it's funny guys, but let me ask you a question. I just kind of have this uh, knack of knowing what my listeners want to know. Um, there's just, just an interesting irony here. And I, I have a lot of friends that I went to high school with and grew up with that became police officers. And I got to tell you, for the most part, they were the biggest knuckleheads I knew. And, you know, here we are hearing this story. And I'm like, I'm wondering, you know, did the, did the kids in the class when you're teaching or know that, you know, you were running away from cops and throwing spools at people um, and getting so drunk you'd black out? You know, it's, it's just interesting because on the other end of that, the reason why you serve so well right now and probably were such a good police officer is because of that. But is there a correlation? I mean, you have that experience on the police force because we're going to go there about how that all started. Is there a correlation between that? Like, is that typical that police officers had some sort of a rough or crazy childhood? Because that's what my perception is. The character, and this was recently put to me by, by a woman named Stephanie Samuels, who's a leading clinician, therapist, works at the Brain Bank in Boston, uh, real big in the Concussion Legacy Foundation. Here's the profile of a cop. Somebody who comes from an awful childhood, born in chaos, lived in chaos, doesn't know how to live without chaos, creates their own chaos, comes from sort of some sort of abuse, either physical, emotional, or sexual, involved in some sort of contact sports, really good at taking care of others, really bad at taking care of themselves. And the first time I spoke with Stephanie, she told me this. And I said, and, and I called my buddy up who introduced me to her. And I said, hey, Mike, did you tell Stephanie anything about me? He goes, no, nah, no. Nah, I just told her this is the guy you want to talk to. And I said, because she pegged me. That's funny. So, and, and guess what? I know a lot of police officers who are that same way. What do you think about that? Um, cause right now, before we, you know, people don't know you yet. Right. And, and we're going to get into that part of the story right now. Um, cause you know, Kevin is just this guy that is just blessing so many people. He's actually on a trajectory right now to like make a massive impact on the world in a positive way, but we're, we're still back here right now. So what is your opinion? I mean, you have a, you have your own, you know, vantage point because you actually were a police officer, but what is your opinion of like this idea of like knowing that for the most part, these po the police officers technically, according to Stephanie Samuels, were kind of nuts. Because there's, there's angels all around us. It's whether right. we choose to see them. Now, as bad as I was as a kid, don't ever think that I never ran in, in face to face with a cop, but I will inevitably tell you that there was two ways. When I was a kid, there was two ways. It's either you're going to get not beaten, not hurt, but you're going to get smacked around by a cop or you're going to get taken home to your parents. Yeah. Ba back in the day where you could, where that was okay. Yeah. I'd rather take the smack from the cop. Yeah. And then there's some jerk cops who would smack you and then take you home to your parents and you get double beating. But most cops have had that experience with another cop and it, and it changed their, their views and it changed their life to the point where if I get caught, it could go one of two ways. It could go really bad or I could take a little bit of street or curb justice. I've had that. I've had that where, you know, some cop, because as a, as a police officer, all they want to do, most cops, all they want to do is just make an impact on somebody's life. Those cops that catch those, those future cops and let them go, it makes an impact on them. They're like, yeah, you know what? That's the guy I want to be like. I want to be like that, you know, because kids are going to be kids. Kids are going to get in trouble. They're going to do stupid things. That's what being a kid is about. They're sort of finding their own way. But the cop who gives that kid grace and allows him to, to, to live another day, the impact that that makes on future cops or people who are thinking about going into law enforcement, they're the best cops. The best well, cops who, who just worked for it his whole life. The, I, would, I would just go ahead and say that the stigma that most kids would have is that cops get off on giving people a hard time. Some do. Right. Some do. So, so that, that goes back to what you were saying before is like, there's nobody that hates that cop that gets off on 
fucking with people than nope. another police officer. Having this conversation with somebody else before you move on on this. Yeah, yeah. Having this conversation. Okay. So, yes, there are cops who were shoved in lockers in high school who, mm. as soon as they get the power, they abuse the power. Wow. But the real cops on the force, the real cops on the force identify those people really well. And there were higher ranking officers who I saw abusing power and I would call them out and I would say the most awful things to them, you know, and there's not much else they could say, because if they say anything back to me, I'm going to go, well, or I get in trouble for anything. I'll say, hey, he was abusing his power. I was stopping him from abusing his power. And now they get in trouble. So they're not, it's, it's a chess move. You know, it's I have them blocked. They're, checkmate. Don't do nothing stupid in front of me. So. That's what makes a good cop. A good cop is is somebody who knows that yin and yang, who knows that good and bad. Because if you were, if you, all you knew in your life was sunshine and rainbows and you only knew the good stuff, how are you going to deal with somebody whose life is born in chaos? Sounds like it's pretty tough to be a good cop. Well, it's not as hard as you think. It's, yeah. it's really not. You, you'd have to be level-headed. Body cameras are making that a little tougher. They're, they're, they're good and they're bad. They're good because they protect you. They always... Well, I never worked with a body camera. We worked with what was called an MVR, a mobile video recorder, which was in the cars. And when they first, I was there when they first came in and everybody was scared. Oh my God, I'm going to get in trouble. That mobile video recorder re it protected me against false accusations every single time. It never once jammed me up. So knowing that going in, but you know, I never wanted to become a cop. It was the furthest thing from my mind. My brother took test after test after test after test. I think I took I applied for the New Jersey state troopers in 99 as a, mm. on a whim. Cause he said, Hey, let's, let's, let's apply for this. So, okay. I apply for it. And now I, I don't, I, I never was arrested. I know I don't even have a parking ticket and I didn't fit their criteria. That's the letter I got. I got the letter in my house somewhere. And I was like, you know, it was no big deal. I was like, Oh, okay. You know, no big deal. So I just sort of shifted around job to job, sold cars. I So as, as I thought the story was, that you got accepted or you passed your test right away. But what you're saying is, is you had prior at an earlier time, you, 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 and it just kind of waved it off. Did, did that kind of, do you remember that moment as like saying, I guess this is not what I'm supposed to do. I, it, it, I would never took it seriously. Right. So when, when I was rejected, it was no big deal. I, 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 the thought of being a police officer because, because of my past, I'm like, you know, I, I don't really fit this bill. I was a right. bad kid. You expected not to get it. Yeah. You know, so it wasn't, it wasn't, it wasn't anything when they said I wasn't even eligible to take the test because I didn't fit their criteria. I was like, all right, no, well, you know, I didn't take this all that seriously anyway. And I just sort of navigating life, you know, I, 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 I did whatever I had to do. You're a, you're, you're a survivor. I mean, one, one thing to point out here, people listening to this story, I don't know what your reality is like at home, but like, I, this is a guy that didn't have any backup plan or support. I mean, like you're on your own from a young age. So 17. Uh, yeah. I mean, I left so, the house and that was it. That, that being said, you know, I mean, you should be pretty proud of yourself, including the, uh, the, the rolling down the hill of the spool. I mean, like you're, you're doing everything on your own. A lot of people know that when they screw up, they can just go they They can fall back on somebody. So how did you full circle come back to it? Because I mean, like your life right now is completely defined by you know some of these traumatic events that happen and we'll get into that but like what brought you back to it i got a i got a job selling software to private clubs moving coast to coast so i got to see this country and i got to see this beautiful country that we live in mm. and most people don't ever get out of their own little micro they, they're stuck inside their own house their own four walls for the for most of their life i think the saddest thing is to never go outside of your town and i know there's lots of people who do it because this country we live in is filled with such great things such great diversity i remember the first the first time i was ever on an airplane I jumped out of it. Second time I was on an airplane, I went to Wisconsin and I drove from this Wisconsin. I was working, I drove from Wisconsin out through Minnesota into the Dakotas. And I see my first herd of Buffalo and the beauty and the majesty of this great plains and these just huge beasts. It was, my eyes just became so wide. And I think I sat there watching, it was a small herd of Buffalo. Let me, listen, I'm not, I'm not dances with wolves, John Dunbar. I am, I am, we're talking about maybe 50 to a hundred Buffalo. And I'm just sitting there watching these things just roam around. And, and you still see, there's still places, there's trails marked throughout the Midwest 
throughout the Great Plains where these buffalo used to used to stampede and it just the, the concave the the they, they changed the topography of the whole plains. Yeah. And it and it just widened my view. But here was the problem. I was 23 years old, 24 years old, something like that. And I'm traveling. Co- no, I was yeah, 24. I'm traveling coast to coast. And it's it's great for about the first six months. But living out of a suitcase, you understand why comedians and people who live on the road become alcoholics because it's very lonely. Mm. There is no home base. You're sitting in your hotel room or what are you doing? You're at the bar. You're at the bar. You're drinking. So it's very easy to slide back into that stuff. So for the the brief times that I was home, I was I was getting back into shape. You know, I was I was trying to do the right thing. And I'm in the gym one day. And I would always train with this guy and I didn't know him. I didn't, I, I didn't know who he was. I didn't know what he did. He just trained really hard. He was an older guy. He was in his fifties at the time, which seems funny because it seems old to me now, <clears throat> not too old or it was old back then. I mean, he was an old man. Right. In your early twenties. And he, uh, and he was working out with this guy and the guy says, uh, we're just talking. And it's, uh, have you ever thought of becoming a cop? And I was like, yeah, you know, I took this, the, I, I applied for the state police years ago, but I didn't take it that seriously. It's not that, not really my dream. And he goes, well, I'm the chief of police and we're hiring and uh, I think he'd be good for it. And that's, that's how it happened. And in New Jersey, in New Jersey, it's very rare because uh, police work in New Jersey is extremely competitive because the pays, the pay scale is so high. So I said, you know, I'm tired of traveling, sold a good product. Hey, you get a pension, you get medical benefits. Um, You know, it was a small town. seems like a good deal. All right. I'll take the test again, not taking it too seriously. It was a basic IQ test. All right. And I did, I, I did very well. And I think I got a 98 and I was mad because I knew what I got wrong and I knew it. And sure enough, I get hired. I get hired in June of 2001 and I'm like, I'm ready to go. You know, I'm like, all right, let's, uh, this, this is just my next venture in life until I backslide or screw it up or, you know, I, I but I took it very seriously, but I was so new. I was so fresh. And I, I remember asking a Lieutenant saying, Hey, if I pull a car over and I get a, I get one of the PBA cards and one of the union cards. What do I do? Like, I didn't even know. I, I had no idea. And he's like, yeah, you know, you let him go. You give him some, you give him some uh, courtesy. And it's like, all right. You know, so I went into the police academy in on August 3rd of 2001. And police academy was a big wake up call. But it fit me because all of a sudden I have something that I never had in my life. I have structure. I have discipline. I have a goal and I fit like I fit like one of those square pegs and I loved it. I absolutely loved it. And because I was, I was, I was 26 when I got hired. So I was, I was a little bit older than everybody else. They made me a squad leader. So I was in command of people and I, I just took to it like a fish in fish in water. And then um, while we're sitting in the Academy one day, early September, our captain comes in and says, um, plane just hit the world trade center. Mm. No big deal. I'm telling you right now, being in the New York metropolitan area for as long as I had lived in this area, that happened all the time. Small planes always hit those big buildings. So we didn't think anything of it. But when it hit the World Trade Center, I remember I'm sitting next to a woman. She was a transit cop. And I remember a look on her face, like a like a concerned look, because her father worked in the World Trade Center at Cantor Fitzgerald. But she wasn't overly concerned. 20 minutes later, we go back to instruction. Uh, 20 minutes later, the captain comes in again. He says, another plane just hit the World Trade Center. Now, all of a sudden, the atmosphere changes. You could drop a pin. We're, mm-hmm. we're starved for information. The woman to my right is ultra concerned now because her father is there. The chaos ensues. You know, we get recalled to our department. And we're a month into the police academy. We're not trained on much. I go into my department, and you got to remember, this is how... This is how weird it was at that time because we didn't know what was going on. We didn't know whether we were fully under attack. I think a plane had just, by the time I got back to my apartment bill or to my department uh, and the way I was driving, I could see the New York skyline. So I could see the towers burning. A plane had hit the Pentagon. And I think they were tracking a bunch of other planes that were in the air. So Lieutenant takes me upstairs to the armory and said, and gives me, gives me my gun. And he says, okay, uh, just don't shoot anybody. Gives me my ammunition. I'm not qualified to carry a gun. It's we're, we're thinking it's war. It's go time. It's 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 time. You know whether you're trained or not, you're more capable than the average citizen off the street. So here you go. And I went out and stood post because we had some high value targets or what they perceived as high value targets. We had uh, 
one of the companies processed like 75% of the world's paycheck. So if that was destroyed, it would have shut down the economy. So we were out there, we were just looking, looking for stuff. And I remember the looks on people's faces. The looks on people's faces were just blank and confused and starved for information. Little did they know, we didn't know anything either. But I remember they're coming up like, hey, did you hear anything? And, and we're like, no, we don't, we, we don't have any information. There's not any information coming out of New York. But that day, police work was defined for me. Police work is when, no, when people don't know where to go, they're going to go to the police. And they're going to expect you to have some sort of calm semblance about you. And they're going to, even if you don't have the answers, they're looking to you to just be a, a voice of that's, reason and authority. That's, that's so interesting because that's... I mean, I, I had my run-ins with cops as, you know, as an idiot kid, but for the most part, that's the way I viewed police officers is when you're in trouble, go find a cop. Yep. Right. And it's interesting to see, you know, how like society is like, it's just, so, I don't even want to get into all these things that just piss me off, but uh, we'll see cops until it's, we it's nice to be reminded of that. And by, and by the way, when that first plane hit the uh, the World Trade Center, Dragon was right near Trinity Church. Wow! Yeah, so I was right there. I was I was one of those people running from the smoke. <laughs> yeah, the, but you know, thankfully, there were people who ran towards it. Yeah, Ooh, I remember them driving past me, and I said, "Oh boy, I never saw them again." So there's two types of people in this world. Yeah, there's those that run towards the danger, and those that runs run away from the danger. And guess what? In police work, that's no different. There are police officers that run away, and there are police sure. officers that run towards. So it's it's just a different sect of the population. But that day, it changed my it changed my views forever, and it sort of solidified what I was meant to do. All of a sudden, now I find my identity that identi that identity as a youth that I was looking for so vehemently and so fervently i found it now in being this voice of reason when people don't know what to do and people yeah. are lost well Interesting. go find a cop so we go back to the police academy you know police work sort of changed after that graduate i hit the streets my first day on the street you're you're coupled with a a, an, a, a veteran officer i can still remember the address it's respond to number 23 for an elderly female who is unresponsive. I walk into this house. Now, the only dead bodies I had seen at this point was in a funeral home. Mm. And, you know, they were very rare because I, I was very shielded from that stuff. And here's this woman in a powder room of a townhouse. And then those are people who know the powder rooms, the downstairs powder rooms of a townhouse, they're extraordinarily small. Well, she was in front of the toilet, which in a spot about that big, praying as if a Muslim was praying. It's not a, it's not a position that an 83 year old woman gets into right I'm a yoga master and i ne i'll never forget and a guy was standing on the other side of her and he's a very good friend of mine and my mentor a guy's name steve sarjace he's standing with his elbows up against the wall that's how small this place was and he looks at me and goes well we got to do something we pull her out get her on her back and now i'm fresh out of the academy so all the training is very fresh in my mind but she was so uh she was in such bad shape that when i put the bag valve mask on her i had to pull her real teeth out so mm. choke on them. You know, you bear the chest, and we're not talking about Farrah Fawcett bearing the chest. Chest. This right. is not something you really want to see. We go to work on her. Unfortunately, she doesn't make it. Mm. And I see. I see. And I see another portion of police work. I see her family members coming in as they're putting her on the stretcher. They're in. She's in the. She's in the bag, and and I see the look on their face, and they're looking for answers. So they're coming to us and saying, "What's going on?" You know, uh, that you're, you're again, people are lost and they're looking for you. So it changed the way. Now, now all of a sudden, this, this dead body in front of me, which I see as a dead body. I'm not seeing that as somebody that used to be human. I've separated myself from that. I'm starting to see, I'm, it's starting to be drawn back that this was a human. People cared about this person. People loved this person. People checked on this person every day. And this person is no more. And you were there at the final moments. The next day, here's another uh, portion of police work. There's a robbery at gunpoint out of a neighboring town. Me and my field training officer catch him. Catch There was two guys. And this is back in the day when glove boxes could magically open. It's amazing. They just pop right open. Well, this glove box magically opens and there's a gun. Uh, they were stealing TVs out of Best Buy or something like that. And then I'm looking, I'm like, oh shit, this just got real. You yeah, know? like you, you, that was the first time you said, oh, that's right. Somebody could hurt me. Yeah. 
Yeah. So I, they're not. So now I'm, I'm just getting all of this training in such an abbreviated time. And this is and again, this is a small suburban service oriented town. This is not an urban environment where you're going call to call to call. But in an abbreviated time, I'm starting to see these things. And then there's police chases because we were I worked in Roseland, New Jersey, and we were 10 minutes away from Newark, connected by a major artery highway. So mm -hmm. they would come into the wealthier areas, steal cars and go back down to Newark. Uh, so you get your fair share of police chases. And the first time you've had a car going up to 120 or 130 miles an hour and you're you're watching that car shake and you're you're smelling all the engine burning. And when it's over the adrenaline dump that you have, you're thinking, well, if I would have hit a pothole doing 130, I'm done. I'm done. But you just brush it off because you got to go to the next call. And that's how life went. But most, the most, and, and people will ask me this to this day, like, what's the most memorable call? And I, I've said this so many times because it sticks in my head and I wish I could find this young man. We go to a emotionally disturbed female and she, she's about ready to end her life. And uh, she's got a knife with her. Her four-year-old child is sitting next to her. And we walk into this situation where we don't know what's going on. And there's there's this woman. We're trying to talk to her. Now, we're taught that you never go, at the time, I believe it was the 25-foot rule. You never go within 25 foot of somebody with a knife because that's how long it's going to take for you to draw your weapon and fire back at her. This woman needed help. So I sat next to this woman. I ignored that 25 foot rule. I did not see her really as a threat, but I shouldn't have gotten that close. And I just talked to her. I talked to her like a human being. At first, her child, whose name was Mason, was was just sort of sidled, sidled up to her. Like he wouldn't leave her side. And here I am, I'm sitting there and, and this is back in the day before police officers wore uh, BDUs, battle dress uniforms. They, they, looked a they look a little bit more rugged now. We were crisp, clean, ironed, collar brass was shined. And he's just looking at everything. And you can see as you can see, and as he's as he's getting more curious and more adventurous, he's coming closer and he's he's touching my radio and he's 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 at, you know, he's pointing to stuff and like, what's that? And then as time moved on, the kids started getting closer and closer and closer. And we were able to talk the woman out, get the kid out to safety, go spend time with his grandmother. Fast forward 10 years and, and you leave the call. You're not thinking anything of it. You're like, OK, well, it was just it was a good job. Fast forward 10 years later, I'm in the supermarket and I hear this this voice calling me from behind. I'm in civilian clothes and they say, hey, Officer Kevin, Officer Kevin. Um, and I turn around. And I go, yeah. They're like, is your name Kevin? I'm like, yeah, yeah. He goes, well, I'm Mason. And a long time ago, you helped out my mom and she's doing really good now. And that's because of you. You're just like you, 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 you know, there's, there's times in your life when you become, you hit that, that skew in the road, that, that fork in the road, and you get a little, you get a little, uh, sidetracked from your mission. And then things like Mason just realign you with, with your path. And that's the most memorable call I have. And it's not, I, I've arrested plenty of people. I've, I've, I've solved Rob. I've done, I've done almost everything in police work, but that's the call that I remember. So, wow. You know, uh, I, I remember hearing the first time you, you told me about that story. So I would assume that, you know, that was probably a moment, the Mason moment where, you know, you were talking about always finding your identity. It's one thing to find your identity, but you know, it's like another for, to feel like I I'm doing the right thing and I I'm useful. <laughs> I, this is, this is what I'm supposed to do. Um, so, you know, what I know about you, and this is how I met you because I'm meeting you on the other side of all these stories about how you, you came to this position. Um, but I, I know that, uh, you know, another sector of your life that's, that's brought you to where you are right now, which has been, you've gone through a lot of dark times, um, happened on July 10th, I believe 2013. So take me to that, that call. The worst thing in, the worst thing in police work is silence. You know, soldiers will say this too. You know, there there'll be great wartime soldiers, and they're really good in the chaos. Peacetime soldiers—that's when they get in trouble. I think Jesse Ventura he classified himself that way. He goes, "I was a great wartime peacetime. I just didn't want to shave. I didn't want to do all that stuff." So, silence in police work is deafening. You know, I remember that particular night we were working what's called a pitman schedule, which is a twelve-hour shift, and uh, it was a Wednesday night. You worked Wednesday, Thursday. I would have been off Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. So 
we sort of put the town to bed if you're working the midnight shift of a 12-hour shift. You go around, you pull on doors, you check your plazas. You got to remember, it's a suburban town. It's a it's a very service-oriented type of police work. And I remember pulling up to my partner that night. We we're drinking coffee, and um, we had officers covering the desk. So my my shift on the desk was coming up very shortly. I think at about 11. And I remember telling him. Uh, God, I wish there was anything. I just, an alarm call, something to get me out of the car, something to just get me moving because this is, this is mind numbing. So I said, you know what? I'm going to go do my checks. I'm going to go pull on some doors. And I pull into the, this plaza parking lot and over the radio, you know, that's how life changes. Life changes at the crack of a radio. Start heading to this address, unknown 911. It's an open line. I can hear arguing in the background. I don't know what's going on. This particular address that we they were, we were dispatched to that night was a well-known address. There was ongoing domestic issues. I think uh, three or four days prior, the female resident applied for a temporary restraining order against her ex-boyfriend who sent her a picture with a Glock 9mm to his head. So we were we knew about it. Uh, we knew where we were going. We kind of had an idea of what was going on, even though it was an open 911 call. 911, when it was set up, it's officers always respond to 911, no matter what's going on, even if it's a misdial. So we start heading down there. I can tell you the route. I turn around real quick. My partner was right behind me because he had just, he we had just left each other. I could tell you the route I took. Uh, I could tell you the speed I was going. It's like 1040 at night, 1045 at night. And we're doing about 70 miles an hour. No sirens, lights. We're trying to get there, but we're trying to get there quietly because we don't want to alert anybody of our presence. We pull up in front of the residence. It's a townhouse complex. And uh, there was three of us that showed up, the, my, my supervisor and my partner and I. We pull up. I park right in front. You know, not it's, it's just something. Leave my car running right up in front. And we go up to the door and I pound on the door. And I can hear a voice on the other end saying, don't come in here. Don't come in here. And I can hear somebody. There, there's arguing. I run back to my car real quick and I get what's called a Halligan bar. It's just a little fireman's crowbar. Now, in situations like that, cops have to come up with a plan very quickly. And it might not be the best plan, but it's the best plan that we could come up with at that particular moment. So that's what we did. My partner was going to go around the back because it was it was uh, locked by both houses on each side. He was going to cover the back sliding glass door. I was going to cover the front. I had my supervisor with me. And on a signal, I was going to start hammering the door pop the crowbar in, we're going to get in the door. You know, contrary to popular belief, you cannot kick down a door, especially a steel door. Um, Hill Street Blues was full of shit. So a signal happens. I start hammering the, the door lock to get the, to get the wedge in. And I hear pop, 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 pop. Four gunshots. Drop the crowbar, retreat behind a little small window. What had happened was the, the guy inside knew we were coming in and he started raising his gun to kill the woman. And my partner through the sliding glass door volleyed, they volleyed rounds at each other. Suspect was hit once in a small in the back, not a, not a moral wound. But what I found out later was had we made entrance to that front door, he was going to shoot us. He, he was ready to, to go out guns a blazing. So you pull back and at this time, you know, it, it was a small, the surrounding town started to arrive. We needed help. They started to sur to, sur uh, to come and they were covering the front entrance. I run around to the back around the townhouse and there's four of us there a uh, supervisor standing behind the deck and the three of us our plan was to go on to this little privacy deck this little nine by ten foot ten by ten foot privacy deck and we're gonna go and and try to make entry our plan was is to throw an object through the sliding glass door gain entry and go in as we're coming up on the deck we can see the victim she's over in the corner she's got her knees to her chest and she's hugging her knees and she's just terrified. You can tell she's, 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 she's not doing well, but we don't see the sus suspect. So I go off to the, the stairs are off to the left. I go over to the right. The other two officers are over to the left. And it was the most, it was most tactically advantageous place I could, I could see because I could see the whole area, but, I, but I still couldn't, I'm, I'm looking for this suspect. And, and the victim's eyes are looking. She's fixated. We weren't quiet. She's fixated at this one point. Chair goes through the window and the brightest flash I have ever seen in my life. I feel the warm heat. I feel the blowback of gunpowder. Because if you ever shot a gun, you get little pellets, the little 
piece of sand, it feels like. This guy just was around the corner. He just shot. The bullet came within a half an inch to my left ear. And it, my ear wiggled. So there's glass all over the deck. I hit the ground. And everything just, the like time just slows down. There was no panic. There was no fear. And I'm thinking to myself, like it, it was so slow that my keys, which you used to put on your radio antenna, fell off. I put them back on. Now I'm laying there. And I what I thought was the best tactical position is now the worst tactical position. I'm ready. This this is not going to end well. I think about my wife at home, my wife, Tricia. I have a three-year-old and I have about an eight-month-old. Uh, my three-year-old will remember me. My, my, my eight-month-old's never going to remember me. And I, I sort of make myself right in the head. And I said, now he shot at police twice. There's no reason to say why he's not going to shoot at police again. I prepare to die. And it's a weird feeling. You know, you can hear everything. You can smell everything. I could tell you what I smelled that night. I could tell you what I heard. And I get in a shooting position. I get in a prone position. The other officers were retreated off the deck. And now they're yelling back, are you hit? Are you hit? And I honestly didn't know. Because you, you're told all the time if you get shot, you're not, you most likely you're not even going to know it. I see blood everywhere. And I'm like, I, I, don't, I don't know. I see a lot of blood. My shoulder hurts. I wasn't shot. But what I found out later is the blood came from, I fell on the glass. I fell on my forearms. And the glass just tore me up. But I'm, I'm prepared to die. And I was trapped there. Now, I can't crawl out. If I crawl out, I go right through that broken glass, and he's going to be able to kill me. I still can't see him. But the other officers, thankfully, one of the officers ran. So he he ran away, left me for dead. I'll never forgive that guy. I, I, you know, I wish him the best, but I'll never forgive him. The other two officers stayed. One of the officers, now I'm not a small guy, and I'm not very nimble. One of the officers grabbed the back of my belt and assisted me out towards the wall, out towards the stairs while the other officer held cover. I get out. Good. We're done. We look, we, we see the suspect. He runs upstairs. And since he's not shooting at us, we're not going to shoot at him. The, the victim gets up, stands up against the wall and just ekes out the front, out the garage. So now the job's over. We call over the radio. Hey, victim's coming out. Don't shoot. It's, it's okay. I don't care if the guy stays in there for 10 years. Now we did our job. We protected life. And that's what we were tasked to do. So then we have to hold perimeter because now we have what's called a barricaded suspect. He's upstairs. He's calling 911. He wants to talk to somebody. I don't care. Do whatever you're going to do. I'm not, I'm not overly concerned about this. We hold, we hold uh, perimeter for two hours. In the July heat, my arms are all torn up. I got glass shards in my, in my, in my uh, forearms. I still have some glass, glass in there today. Until the state police teams unit, which is like their SWAT team, shows up. They relieve us. Now, mind you, this, this whole incident is about two and a half hours. My cell phone is in my car, which is still running in front of the house, which I can't get to because he's upstairs and he could he could shoot me. We know he has a gun. I can't even call my wife. See, police world's very small. And when somebody hears something, they're going to call, the, the wives are going to talk and they're going to call each other. And all I'm thinking, and now that I'm out of danger, is I hope my wife doesn't hear this before I have a chance to tell her. I'm, I, I get forced into an ambulance. I didn't want to go forced into an ambulance. I borrow one of the EMT cell phones and I call my wife. And this is like 1230 at night, 1245 at night. And imagine maybe, maybe one o'clock. Imagine your spouse, you're a spouse of a police officer. You know, your husband's working. You get a call from an unknown number at that late at night. And it's me on the other line. I said, Tricia, I was in a shooting. I'm okay. I'm not shot. I have to go to the hospital. I have to get glass removed from my arms. I'll call you as soon as I can. And I hang up the phone. My wife is one of the strongest people I've ever met in my life for being able to take that on and not lose her mind in the middle of the night with two small children. at home. I, I go to the hospital and they remove the glass from my arm as much as they can. And I go home. I go home. We get the suspect out. He gets arrested. I, 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 I can't believe what happened. Like, this is not the job. <laughs> Like, you, know, you never expect anything like this to happen, but it, it did. So I go home and I'm so amped up. I can't sleep. I go out for a run. That doesn't do it. I try to get some sleep. It doesn't really work. When I finally get up, my phone's blowing up. You know, everybody wants to know what's going on. I check on the other officers who are there. That's, that's my primary concern. Are you guys okay? We'll figure this out together. And I hug my wife and my children thankful that I'm home. But so they, they tell me at the hospital, you don't have to go back to work Thursday. So great. I got a four day weekend. 
awesome. This is a vacation because at the time, you know, everything's good. We did our job. We did our job well. And, uh, you know, life moves on. But I don't have to go back till Monday. So <clears throat> thank you so much for sharing that. But, you know, kind of kind of like your experience with your dad, <clears throat> you know, it's like when you're when you're going through these things, you know, your natural process is to do your best to move on, you know, um, but we very often don't know, you know, what's actually happened to us as a result, you know, and this concept of post-traumatic, I, I know that you don't call it a disorder, you know, I think I've, I've heard you call it PTS instead of PTSD. I love that. When, for the first time I heard somebody say that. But it's actually not a disorder. So the psychological circles are starting to classify it as post-traumatic stress because a disorder is, so So the, the reaction to trauma is natural and normal. Therefore, it cannot be a disorder. It's an, it's the brain's normal reaction to, to trauma. In, in the spirit of my show, it makes perfect sense. <laughs> I love that. But but tell me about this because you know what's ironic about this for me right now because I know what you're doing right now and I know why I do what I do and it it it, it just ironically comes from a really shitty experience, right? But what was it like? Because you didn't know that you had PTS until it started showing up so um what was that like for you like after this event um did you just feel like you go right back to work because because you're in this heart-driven passionate service oriented thing you're probably grateful that you're alive um but then how did you know when you had a problem so my wife overjoyed that i'm home we want to just get away. We get her mother to watch the children. Her and I go out and get something to eat. We're going to go see a movie. We're going to go, we go choose a comedy. Obviously you don't want to do something too heavy. She's just grateful that I'm okay. We go out and watch. This is the end by Seth Rogen and no, no knock on Seth Rogen, but this was not the movie I should have went to go see. There's a there's an interesting a, choice of movies to go see <laughs> at the time he was big. So I, you know, uh, but there's a scene in the beginning of the movie where, the people who are good get sucked up to heaven by this big bright light. And then people who aren't so good stay on earth, but there's this loud noise and it's a big bang. As soon as the bang happened, I, my chest felt like my heart was going to explode. I started sweating. I couldn't breathe. And now I'm sitting next to this woman who, who has endured so much. And I can't tell her because number one, she's not going to understand. She'd been through enough. So I just excused myself. I said, you know, my uh, we, we went out to eat. So I blamed it on my stomach. I said, you know what? My stomach's not feeling good. I'm going to go to the bathroom. I go out into the hall and I can't move. I can't breathe. I can't talk. I'm pouring sweat. My shirt is soaked. I don't know what's going on. I'm stronger than this. I grew up in, 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 in a hell house. I grew up doing every bad thing known to man. And I can't handle this. Like, what the hell is going on with me? And you start feeling weak. You start feeling less than yourself. And you you just you that you're just plunged back into that chaos that you just took at the time. Um, what was I? Thirty. I was thirty eight. I got plunged back into chaos, and at thirty eight, I didn't know where I was going to end up here. So my wife, you know, and every time I tried to go back in there because this is like fifteen minutes. I'm standing out there. The, the door just feels like lead. I can't move the door. I can't. So finally she comes out and she goes, are you okay? And I said, yeah, you know what? My stomach is so upset. Go back in there. I'll be right in. She goes, nah, this movie sucks anyway. And we go home. She took pity on me because she knew something wasn't right. That was the night that I started having some of the worst nightmares of my entire life. You know, you, you, it starts off. It's just like, uh, do you ever have one of those nightmares when you're sick and it's just, you, you never have that restful sleep. That was me every night. Uh, you pull your gun out, you're on a, you're on a job, you pull your gun out and you pull the trigger and the bang flag comes out or you, you pull your magazine out to load your weapon and all the ammo spills everywhere. And it's just, it's, it's chaos. That weekend we go down to see my parents and we bring, bring the kids down and it's fine. I was very quiet. I was very contemplative. My brother, who was also a cop started asking me about it. And I'm like, I just remember going like this, just, no, I just, uh, this, this is not the time. I don't really don't want to talk about it. So as we're going to leave. My three-year-old spills chocolate milk all over his seat. I lost my mind. I mean, I lost my mind. We had a two-hour drive home, and my wife was begging me on the Garden State Parkway in New Jersey to pull over and let her and a three-year-old and an eight-month-old eight-month old out. That's how bad it was. But that trip home taught me something, taught me that something's going on. I need help. 
and I call this uh, I call this cop hotline, and they pair me up with a therapist. Let me ask you a quick question: when when that was happening with your kid, if you can remember, did you know what you were doing and how fucked up it was, or were you just fully in a reactive mode? I couldn't stop. It was just like it it was. I just couldn't stop. I couldn't let it go. It was just chocolate milk. He's three years old. But you were, but you were unaware. You didn't have the ability to wa- observe it from another vantage point and see that it was happening. It was involuntary. It was just like happening. It was disgusting. Is what right. it was. It was. It was awful. And I can see that now through, you know, time heals those wounds, and and I can see that now. But when I was in the middle of it, it was just this built up rage that was right. just coming out over and over again. And I call this law this. So Monday. I, I call this this helpline and they sort of talk me off a ledge a little bit. And But Monday I have to go to the doctors because I have to get the remainder of the glass removed from my arms and find out what my medical status is in order. Because I'm still planning on going back to work. Well, the nurse, I'm sitting in the office and the nurse is picking away and I can feel the glass in there. And so she she sees me. She sees a look on my face. She, I hadn't slept much. And she says, you okay? And I said, yeah, you know, it's just glass. It's no big deal. And she says, no, I'm not. It's not what I'm talking about. I'm like, are you okay? And that that question broke me because I just started crying in the middle of a doctor's office. And I knew there was something that was seriously wrong. Well, that day, my department scheduled what's called a critical incident, a critical incident stress management debriefing. That's supposed to be taken care of within 48 to 72 hours. My department really didn't. Because you got to remember, police departments didn't really deal with mental health at that time. My, I, If you ask me how much training I had in the police academy on mental health, it's a big goose egg. We had none. It's... We were told from day one, if you got a problem, be quiet about it because they're going to take your gun away. So I go into the department for this debriefing and we go through it and all. And one of the lieutenants had mentioned something about we, we had our shotguns taken out of the car for some reason. Somebody left a round in there or something. And I was like, oh, great. You know what? Some good will come out of all this. Some good stuff. And then I found out they were only going to be in supervisor's cars. And I lo- again, it was the same thing with my son. I lost my mind. I started yelling at a lieutenant. These are things that I could get fired for. Mm. The people around me, the other officers who were there, picked me up and walked me downstairs. And we went outside. And that was the, the second to last time in the police department. The next time I was ever in the police department was to pick up my retired ID. I never went back. I went to work Wednesday at 7 p.m. on July July 10th, and I was never a police officer a day, uh, again after that. And Let me I, ask you a question about that. So you know, because because one of the one of the things I'm trying to make sense of is is the stigma of overall, you know, men's mental health. But but we're in the the belly of the beast here because this is you know this is a, a, a precinct. You know, um, so part of what I'm hearing is that. You know, you're supposed to keep it quiet if you're having a problem. Um, but there's also a fear of losing your job and so many things. But, you know, when you when you got to that point where you knew you had a problem and it was apparent that you were no longer going to be able to work as a police officer anymore, did you feel any compassion at all from, you know, the precinct, your your superior officers or, or some of your brethren or as you remember it, did everybody just kind of like pretend it wasn't happening? What was that like? So administration, absolutely not. Administration was cold, uncaring. As a matter of fact, during a deposition, my my old chief of police, the man who hired me, thought I had retired because I had glass in my arm. Well, they don't give you your pension for having glass in your arm. Um, there were people who who reached out occasionally. And then there were other people who I expected to reach out that didn't. But here's the thing. So those people who did reach out rarely got the phone picked up by me because I didn't know what to say. Mm. I, I was I was not good. I was just I was starting to drink and I was starting to go down this bad hole. Were, were you ashamed? Very ashamed at the way I was acting. Yeah. I, I was stronger than this. I'm supposed to be. I'm a cop, for God's yeah. sake. I'm supposed to be stronger than this. And and then the people who didn't reach out, I was really mad at them for a long time. I'm like, how you know, you were supposed to be my friend. How how do you how are you so cold that you don't even have this compassion towards me? Looking back, they didn't know what to say. And and if they did call, I wouldn't have picked up their call anyway. So, you know, forgive and forget. 
I don't, I don't hold any, I don't bear any ill will towards them. And I'm seeing therapist after therapist and things are getting worse because now they're prescribing me things. The, 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 the protocol is a anti-anxiety and an antidepressant. Antidepressants have some of the worst side effects I've ever, I've ever experienced. Uh, the ex Now you're already feeling like less of a man. Take an antidepressant. You're going to feel like less of a man. Wow. The anti-anxieties, actually, I like the anti-anxieties because I was drinking so much and it was starting to become really expensive. But if you take a couple of Klonopin and you start drinking, you get drink, drunk really quick, but it could kill you. Right. It, people die of that all the time. Probably not thinking too much and being too concerned with dying at this point, though. No, then you start having the suicidal ideations, mm. suicidal fantasies. Now, I never carried my off-duty gun. Never. I started carrying it because I wasn't sleeping. I was paranoid. I'm drinking. I'm drunk all the time. And I'm just, I, I, I can't work. Talk about the busy bee has no time for sorrow. Well, all I had was time for sorrow because I hadn't, I wasn't allowed to work. I wasn't even allowed to work. I, I worked a second job at the time. I wasn't even allowed to work my second job. So I'm home all day long and I'm just. What's going on with your wife at this time? I mean, she's watching you. I mean, this is a wife that picked up on the fact that you needed to go home at the movies. Um, is she just getting conditioned to realize that you're just fucked up and doing the best she can? Or like, is that, are, there, are things escalating at home? You know? So my wife bore the, the brunt of a lot of my bad behavior. Cause when you're, when you go through something like this, it's thought action. There's no buffer zone. I'll give you a, for instance, you're walking down the street, you see somebody who's done you wrong or is, you, you're not friendly with you, but I like to split in their face. But then there's that piece of your brain that's going to say, you know what? That's not a good idea. When you go through something like this, it's I'm going to spit in their face and you do it. So my wife got called every name in the book. Mm. My wife got screamed at constantly. My wife got stuff thrown at her. Now, the worst thing I ever did to my life is I spit right in her face. Wow. There is no, demor no more demoralizing action than spitting in part your partner's face. The person that you're supposed to love above everybody else. And she took it and she just. Are you guys still married? Yeah, we're still married. She, she's awesome. She, Trisha Donaldson. I mean, she. Well, we're all, we're offline. You give me your address. I'm gonna send her a fucking. Or something. <laughs> so I, I I spend the rest of my life trying to make this up to her. That's that's the downside of this. The downside of this is I have to always I, I have to always be uh, to to be the better husband because of all the stuff that she went through. Well, but, well, I mean, in in the same light, and we'll get to that in in a in a short uh, minute here. You're also spending the rest of your life working within the realm of helping people that, you know, might be going through what you're going through. So we're, we're in this, we're in this dark space. We're numbing ourselves. We've found out how to make ourselves drunker and for cheaper. And, you know, just the way I'm looking at it is like, there, there is no way out. I know what it's like to actually be in that place where killing yourself is an option. So I've been there. The so the Tell point, about that. point of that came my son I, I my younger one he's a baby he would cry and it would drive me crazy it would just it would my anxiety would go through the roof but my three-year-old my three-year-old i bought him all the toys that i had when i was a kid you know nerf guns and stuff one day my son points a nerf gun at me and there's a maneuver police will do where you rip the gun out of there and you just sort of just turn it around you practice it over and over again so it becomes mechanical well, my son pointed a nerf gun at me my three-year-old and pop i do this maneuver on him not thinking. And I look at his face and, and I don't, I don't know if you have children or not, but I that, do. that, that look, that blank look on the kid's face, like, Oh my God, what, what happened? Yeah. I know what I did. I took the gun, I broke it in two and I threw it in the garbage. And then I walked out of the house. I took my truck. I parked it in a lot. I walked about it. I turned my cell phone off, threw it in the, threw it in the glove box. And I walked about a mile in where there's a wooded area. And I stayed in the woods for three, three, about three and a, two and a half days, let's say three days. Wow. I had a bottle of water and I just sat up against a tree, didn't sleep, just thinking like my life is just an absolute mess. I'm, I'm becoming this monster to my family. I'm not any good at home. I'm not even pulling in, like I'm getting, I'm still getting paid, but in my mind, I'm, I'm not a productive member of the family. So I start coming up with plans on how to do it. Now I have my gun with me and, um, so that would be one option for whatever reason I didn't. After three days, I go home and I'm, I, I, I stopped sleeping in the bed because I was having night terrors and I didn't want to wake my wife. So I'd sleep downstairs about two in the morning one night. I said, all right, this is it. This is time. Write a note, 
all the bank passwords, anything that I think that she's going to need with whatever damage, whatever irrational mind I was having. I go into my office, which was a converted bedroom. And on my wall, I had all my memories, you know, um, my grandfather, my, my diplomas and anything that I was ever proud of accomplishing. And I stood and I'm looking at this wall and I have my, my, my gun in my hand. It's a chief special 38 Smith and Wesson loaded up with hollow points. I take the gun and I put it in my mouth. I, I still feel the metal on my teeth. Like I, you, you asked me the metal on my teeth, the, the sights brushing against my teeth. Um, I cocked the hammer back to make it a single action instead of a double action. I put my thumb on the, the trigger. The, the ridges are very clear on my thumb. And I replay this incident in my head. And I'm crying and I'm looking for a reason. Please don't do this. Please, 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 please. Just give me some reason that I, I don't have to do this stuff. Because this is not what I want to do. But there's no other option. I have no yeah. out. And uh, I held this gun in my, what seemed like forever. But it was probably about 15, 20 minutes. And then I just pause. I just stop pull the gun out of my mouth and I hold it in my hand and I'm just looking at it. I'm on my knees in, in like there's plush carpeting on the ground and I just have this brief pause. And then you start thinking afterwards, you're like, I was just going to kill myself in my house because I'm, I'm a burden to my family, but my kids could come down and find me. They're going to hear the gunshot. They're going to get woken up. My wife's going to come. Her husband's head's going to be missing. Oh my God. What did you do? What did you do? The next day I never told my wife didn't know that for the longest time. Um, the next day I take my gun, I call a buddy, one of the guys I, I still did talk to. I said, look, I can't have my gun in my house anymore. Can you just, and I, no explanation needed. He's like, all right, bring it over in a safe. He takes it. I give it to him and the guns out of my house. But unfortunately there are many different ways to skin a cat. Um, you know, what's I want to, I want to just capture something there. Cause there's this, there's a part of the whole you know, culture of police officers, like you said, where people won't talk about things, but it doesn't mean they don't know about things. And and it shows up sometimes where you could be like, hey, get this fucking gun out of the house. And there doesn't need to be a conversation about it. It's just like, I'll be right over. Yep. You know, so was there a lot of that in the police force where there was this just mutual understanding, yet maybe you're not supposed to talk about certain things, but like, you know, there's there's a lot of communication that can take place with energy and, and eyes and stuff. Um, probably the same thing of when you guys can't talk to each other and you're on site and there's a, there's a gunman and stuff and you guys are feeling each other's vibe. Was there like a mutual understanding about some of the fucked up things you guys go through and how it affects you negatively amongst police officers? Or was it completely ignored? You try to be there for each other okay you try in whatever form and fashion whatever that looks like you do try to be there for each other one of the guys who he would he would forcibly come over my house and and he would call first but i would never pick up the phone right and i would sit in my driveway in a in a chair with my bottle of tequila and he would just show up at my house and sit there with me yeah that guy the guy i handed my weapon to he was another one that i did trust to, to know and, and trust is coming from he's going to he's going to take care of this and not tell anybody because that's what you don't want anybody to know you want you want to minimize the damage yeah and uh and they're, and they're, they're in their own way hanging by a thread you know it's like that's probably part of the of the the stigma it's not just hey you're a man suck it up it's also like i can't handle this you know, right because everybody's got their own coping mechanism um, so there's probably a lot of that going on where you don't want to become a burden on somebody else because they got enough shit to deal with, that kind of thing. Well, police officers were a little bit different. When we yeah. see the oppor opportunity to help somebody, right? that's what makes us feel good. It's helping yourself that you guys are terrible at. We're, we're, we're horrible. Like I said earlier, we're horrible at helping ourselves. We're really right. good at helping other people. All right. I can't get out of my own way. But thankfully, these people put their own stuff aside in order to come just throw a lifeline. And they did. There was many other suicide attempts. There was, I tried to hang myself. I tried to drink myself to death. I tried to take too many pills. And when, when you fail, this is the worst part. You already feel like a failure. Right. Now you're failing at killing yourself. So now I'm like, I can't even do this. Like I'm a loser. Yeah. I, yeah. I, mean, I woke up on the, on the garage floor after I tried to hang myself, the rope breaks. <laughs> I must've knocked myself out. Either I choke myself out or knock myself out, but I didn't kill myself.
And it goes on like that for a while. But there was a therapist who really, uh, and th there was the day that I was told I could never be a police officer, which was one of the hardest days. Mm -hmm. And he, he comes in, and my therapist got him, Dr. Eugene Stefanelli, who, old Italian from Newark. If you've ever seen the many saints in Newark, that was him. And the guy was at Woodstock. I mean, he's 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 like the Forrest Gump of New Jersey. He he brings in this gun, and it's a Colt 45, um, 1945, World War II, blue, Bakelite handles. And he, he puts the gun in my hand, and he's like, hey, listen, I'm looking at, I'm going to try to sell this gun. What do you think of it? And I hold this thing in my hand, and you know you don't want to seem unmasculine, so you're like, oh, it's a nice gun. But meanwhile, I'm starting, he's watching my reaction. I didn't know this. He's watching what I'm doing. I'm starting to sweat. And I couldn't get the gun out of my hand fast enough. And he tells me to this day, because he is a friend of mine, and he says, I knew right then and there you were done. It was almost like he was testing you. He absolutely was. Yeah, wow. And he also told me, you got to check yourself into rehab. Right. And I did. I checked myself into rehab. I got clean. I got sober. Um, and I started looking at things without the bad decision making that alcohol team seems to accompany. Yeah. One of the things I started around this time was group therapy and group therapy was, you know, you feel like you're all alone in this world, but group therapy gave me the opportunity to see other officers in the same situation who are going through the same exact things, the same pr troubles at home. And now all of a sudden you start to feel somewhat normal. You start to return to the, yourself. If, even if it's only for an hour, once a week, you start to return and you start to say, okay, oh, thank God. It's just a little bit of respite. Yeah. I go through, the whole retirement process. And I finally retire June 1st, 2014. Now I'm 39 years old. I have no idea what I'm going to do with the rest of my life. 39. That's 39. young, man. Wow. I have no idea what I'm going to do with the rest of my life. Looking back on it, I could have done, you know, you're, you're free. You can do anything you want to do. It's, it's nothing different than me going to college and being able to reinvent myself. I could totally reinvent myself. It's a freedom that very few, few 39 year olds with a family have. But you're, but you're not well. I mean, you, you got to heal. I'm healing. I'm starting the healing process. But one of the things that really healed me, remember, we're really good at taking care of other people. Mm. As new people started coming in to therapy and I started helping them because I saw it in their eyes. I saw exactly the path that they're going to take. And I'm like, I'm not letting this person go down the path that I took. Give them my phone number and I would stay with them and I'd hound them and I'd bug them. and I'd show up at their house and I'd say, you know, listen, and I tell them, I tell them what I went through and it, it would just give them a little bit of peace. And the funny thing started happening is I started feeling better. Yeah. When I, when I, when I reached that person, when I just made an impact on that person, I can no longer be a police officer, but I can still impact lives. And I just started doing that. And I stayed in group therapy for a very long time. And I, I helped a lot of guys through the pension system and even to the detriment, you know, you, after you retire, you'll get some calls from police officers. Hey, I'm, I'm thinking about retiring. What do I say? Well, how about you tell the goddamn truth? Mm. All right. Cause I went through hell to get to here and you're going to try to figure out what to say. That's, that's, that's the wrong way to look at it. And then, you know, that goes on for a long time. And I, I would, uh, anytime there was a shooting locally, I would find the person's information through back channels. We'd get in touch with them and I just call them and say, Hey, listen, you don't know me. My name's Kevin Donaldson. I was an officer in Roseland. I was in a shooting. I, was, I had some bad times. Let's talk. Let's, let's go meet for dinner. And it happened. Like providing them with something that you could have used. Right. Just some, some peace. Right. That's all it's, I want to do. You, you told that whole story about trying to find your identity. It's like identity 2.0 now. It's mm -hmm. like, it's like, here's, here's an interesting question for you. If you look at your whole story, you found your identity as a police officer. Was that a little bit of a mirage or a fugazi? I mean, is, is who you are right now the identity that you've always been searching for? It was always there. Okay, I just had to formulate it a little bit better. You have to go through some shit to get here. <laughs> I, I hope, hey, for for the rest of the listeners, you know, uh, I hope that you don't have to go through all this to figure out what. And if we do find me, I'll I'll talk to you. Yeah. But I was always service oriented, and it always made made me feel better to help my fellow man. Yeah, especially you know, college on up. I, you know, I got into teaching to try to to shape young minds. Mm -hmm. I got into police work to make a difference in somebody's life. Well, those things all have a, a beginning and an end, right? They have a beginning and an end to everything to, and, and never put your full faith in something that's got an ending. Right. 
If, oh, you know, the only thing you should put your primary identity into is something that is unshakable, unwavering, and will never end. Too many cops do this. That's why that's why the average cop will die five years after retirement because that's all they were. That's all they that's all they knew. And now they're left out into the wild and they don't know how to survive out in the wild. All they know is how to be officer this or sergeant this or lieutenant this. And, uh, you know, that's why we're losing so many officers daily. We just had another one say county sheriff went into a restaurant, put a gun to his head, ended it. And it happens on a daily basis. Right. Um, the, the big problem with group therapy and, and the good feelings is it lockdown hit and yeah. everything shut down. Isn't that interesting, man? It's like nobody thought about that. I mean, all people that were in therapy thought about that. But like, you know, when what lockdown meant for me is I was in the process of an adoption and I Homeland Security shut down and we couldn't complete our adoption. But I never even thought about the fact like of all these AA and therapy and group. Th I mean, like what happened? You know, they had, would they do that in fucking Zoom? You know, Zoom, Zoom just doesn't give you the no. same. Yeah, you, you need to like I need to I need to feel somebody's hand when yeah. I shake their hand. Yeah. And um, you know, and that's that's kind of the birth of of my podcast. That's that was that was how it started. It's just an extension of group therapy. It's that simple. And and that's the suffering podcast. That's the suffering podcast. You know, I started on a whim and my wife is used used to my craziness, right? When did now. you start the suffering podcast? The, the official first airing was December 21st, 2020. And I started it. Episode you, you took to the airways. Yeah. So it was audio only. It was just, it was a hobby thing. In the same room I'm sitting right now is where, where it was started. Episode nine, I bring my partner, Mike Falace on and him and I just vibe real well together. He was another member of group therapy who I tried, I'd helped through. So he got it. He understood it. And you know, we've been going strong now for almost three and a half years. And, uh, but the reach that we've had, so we took this concept of helping our fellow man. Right. And we moved it one step forward. And what, what I realized is when I, when I think back to the guy who shot at me, his name was Anthony Vocatoro. It's all public record. So I can say his name. I used to hate him. Mm. I used to really hate him because he, I feel like he ruined my life. He took my career away. I'm looking back. And this is this is how your your perception changes. I'm looking back on him. I'm like, what did this guy have to get to, right? In order to shoot at police tw multiple times. Wow. Put a gun, almost kill his his fiance. Now, it took me a long time to figure out that he wasn't shooting at Kevin Donaldson. He was shooting at a cop. This was not personal. And then once I got to that point, if I saw him today, like if you if you go back nine years and I see him, him and I are fighting, right? Uh, fighting to the death. If I see him today, I'd shake his hand and I said, listen, brother, it's all good. I, you had to be through some some really difficult pain. And I'd give him a big giant hug because here's how I see it. He put me in the place where I was supposed to be. There's no chance meetings, right? And he put me in a place where I can really do what I feel best at, which is impacting lives. And it started with the podcast, of course. You know, you, you, you're getting people in with trauma and how they overcame it, their method of overcoming, because it's different for everybody else or for, for each individual person. And they're getting over their trauma and it's giving hope to certain other people. Somebody's going to listen to it. Uh, uh, somebody uh, who's a victim of sexual abuse, childhood sexual abuse. And we've had people from all walks of life. But it grabbed, you know, it here, here's the bottom line is it made me feel better. It was my form of therapy. Are you, are you at your best right now? I am. I'm at my most clear. Isn't that interesting? Because, you know, one of the things we teach on the on our podcast in our community is to gain the ability and the new perspective of not just at looking at things that happen to you, but asking how they happen for you, which takes a lot of work sometimes. So, you know, you just, you just made that distinction in just a weird way. And a lot of people just won't get this because they haven't experienced something like this, but like that guy played a big role in you being at your best. He played oh. the most pivotal role. Isn't that crazy? You ever see the movie Joe versus the volcano? Of course. Okay, I want to watch. I want you to rewatch that movie with these type with I'm this sun, sun kissed with the pony woo. Watch that movie now with what I'm going to tell you. Mm -hmm. There's symbols in that movie. That movie is that movie is so underrated. It's yeah. crazy. Yeah. There's symbols in there. You'll see this 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 windy road that goes backwards and upwards and downwards and backwards again and upwards all throughout the movie. That symbolism is from the the path he walks to get into work 
to the path he takes up to the volcano. It's this long, windy road. Right. And sometimes it goes back. Sometimes it goes up. Sometimes it goes to the right and the left. That's my path. Yeah. That is my path. My path is I started at the bottom of this volcano and I took this long, windy road. And one day I got to the top of the volcano and I decided to jump and it spit me out. Spit you out. And put me in a position where I'm supposed to be. I feel the best when I reach somebody. Like that's when I start feeling, okay, this there's value to all this stuff that I've been through. This it's no longer why me, it's it's why not me. I was the person who who did this because if it was if this opportunity was given to somebody else, they may not have been strong enough to do it. And it's no knock on them. It's yeah. I was the person that was chosen for this mission. I'm going to complete this mission until the day I die. That's what that's what's so sad about those stories about the guy that goes into the diner and, and actually kills himself is you look at a guy like that and recognize not only what a shame, but man, that guy could have helped a lot of people if he, if he made it through that. So you got it. You got to wonder if God, the universe, the powers that be spared you for a bigger purpose. I'm sure you think about that stuff. I have never met one interesting person in my life that doesn't have some junk in their past. That's right. Never once. Yeah. And it's put this, this show has put me on the path back to my faith mm -hmm. on episode 17. I have a gentleman named Adam Burt in Adam Burt used to play professional hockey for 14 years. I figure out somebody introduced me to him. He lives locally. I'm going to get him on this budding show. He agrees for whatever reason, this guy agrees to, I mean, this guy fought Wayne Gretzky, in the National Hockey League, and now he's going to come in, in somebody's basement to talk on an audio podcast. I mean, who, what is going on here? Turns out he's a preacher. Yeah. He's a preacher. He's a man of God. Uh, I, I always I always said if I ever had the chance, Kemp, because she's passed away, to meet Mother Teresa, I'd be like, what did you do? Yeah. <laughs> right? So um, this has manifested, you know, into how I met you. You know, we were at this creative con, and you were talking about, you know, I was actually there when they actually had their book launch, but, you know, he paired up with uh, just an amazing individual and Chris Anderson, um, who is, what is the name of the, the, the TV show? It's escaping me. Um, so he was on first Reasonable 40, doubt, and right. then reasonable doubt, reasonable doubt, first 48. Um, so you guys get together and he's got his own story. That's another one. Maybe I'll have him on the show sometime. Um, but tell me about this book, man, you're crazy. And, what it means to you and what your mission is, what your purpose is. So it's just stuff just keeps coming in front of me at the right time. Yeah. I, I'm on Clubhouse. A friend of mine, Charlie Cifarelli, says, Hey, you give Clubhouse a shot. I go on Clubhouse. I'm like, Hey, you know, it's just like a glorified chat room. I don't really know what this is and stuff. And that's I meet right. this woman on there, this woman, Julie Loken. Yeah. That's and, how I know you. And yeah. And, and I just, and I meet this person and I meet Chris on there. She's, Oh, I want to introduce you to Chris. He, you know, she tells me who he is. And I, 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 once I saw him, I knew who he was and we hop on this. She goes, I want to get together on a zoom call. I just want to talk. I just want to talk. That's all I want to do I said, okay. You know, so I hop on a zoom call. Chris is there and Chris and I start, <laughs> we just first, start. First time you met him. First time I met him. We just start going back and forth. You know, we're, we're two cops. We know the game. We can spot another cop. And then out of, I, I'm not, JC, I'm not, I'm not lying to you. Out of that Zoom meeting, man, you're crazy is born. Hmm. While we're in that Zoom meeting, Julie's doing something on the side. She comes up with the, the basic format for the cover. And then we just start this year long journey of writing this thing. But I was so amped up and I had, I had all this stuff to come out that she she wants us to give in 3,000 words in like a month. I give her 20,000 words in three months. <laughs> That's right. I just throw it up. You know, I throw it out there. And, you know, it's a long, again, even writing a book, you you know this for certain, even writing yeah. a book is just a long, windy road. It's never yeah, a straight it's line. Exhausting. And, um, but I found a lot of peace in it. And, and I love doing it because it was the first time that soup to nuts, my whole my whole life is is down on paper. Mm. No matter what happens to me, no matter what happens to me after this show, I have this legacy that that is out there for my kids one day to discover. And they kind of know what happened, but they don't know the full story because they're they're you know they're fourteen and eleven, so they don't know the full full story. But they they have a pretty good idea, and they know I wrote this book and stuff. 
And, um, you know, Chris and I got together and when we get together, it's the, it's the funniest thing. It's like, we knew each other our entire lives. And he, he's from, he's from Birmingham, Alabama. Yeah, um, you, you know, you guys don't look anything alike, but you, but you, you walk around like brothers. <laughs> we do. And, and, you know, we just sort of hang, Chris and I spent some time, uh, in February of 2023, we spent a few days together in New Jersey and, and, uh, we just really got to know each other and, and we'll call each other up from time to time. And, but we, we meshed real well yeah. and there was that synergy in there. And then we bring in Julie introduced us to Dr. Sherry Campbell, who wrote the opening and the closing. Yeah, she's and she She's been on my show. Yep. She's Dr. Great. Sherry. I got to tell you, she is, she's something else. Yeah. She, just don't ask her about her parents. That's all. Well, so that's the part her, her and I we 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 I know, right? with. I know, right? And she's this. Everybody has been such a big blessing when it comes to this stuff, and I'm I'm overly grateful. And we launch in Chicago, and the book goes number one, and um, and I'm starting to, and people are my friends are starting to buy the book, and they're reading the book, and they're telling me about it, and it's just it's this another level of of reaching people that I never thought was possible. Yeah. I am a poor it keeps, kid. keeps getting better. I am a poor kid from Southern New Jersey. Yeah. I am not this type of person to, to, to reach people, to be. This, this was here. not supposed to happen. No, I'm, I'm not supposed to be sitting here with Dr. JC with dragon. I'm not supposed to be sitting here. Right. Okay. But something led me here, this long and winding road. And I'm, every day I got to pinch myself that I can't believe this is happening. So great place to to put a to put a bow on on some things. What I'd love you to do is end with what is your message for the world, um, and also let everybody know what it is that you determined was the biggest lie. Biggest lie I ever told myself is the world is better off without me. Right. That is the biggest lie I ever told myself. The biggest lie that anybody will ever tell whoever's an advocate out there for whatever it is, whether it's sexual abuse, whether it's mental health, whether it's mental health and first responders, the biggest lie anybody will ever tell you is those are the biggest lie that other people will think about them is that they have it all together. I still have my days. I still have my moments. I still get down. I suffer from imposter syndrome constantly. So just because I go out and advocate for it, don't ever think I have it all together. If you can look upon people, I mean, you could, you could go down the line. You think Jordan Peterson's got it all together? I'm telling you what, he doesn't have it all together. He says it openly, he doesn't. Nobody has it. So that's the biggest lie. And my message to the world is, you're never as good as your best day, nor are you as bad as your worst day. You sit somewhere in the middle and uh, there's peaks and valleys in, in, in every walk of life. And one of my favorite Psalms is Psalm 23. It's, yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. It's a very important point in that. I walk through, you know, when it's too dark and you can't see, and you're walking through that dark space, just keep walking because eventually you're going to hit some, hit some light. But also you got to remember when you're in that darkness and you think that you're all alone, there are people next to you. It's just so dark. You can't see, but they have night vision and you have to trust that if you're walking forward, they're going to keep you in balance. They're going to keep you in play. And when it starts to get a little lighter, you look around to your right and your left and you're like, holy cow, these people have been here with me all the time. So now it's my turn to be that person walking with other people. That's fantastic. So obviously um, get out there be in the show notes. I don't know what format you might, you might be listening to this as a podcast. You might be watching this on a YouTube video. There's going to probably be a long format of it and a short format. I think we've, we just had like a 12 hour discussion, but uh, check out the, uh, the suffering podcast, go get the man, your crazy book. Um, but the, the last thing I'd love to do, and I'll put this in the notes as well, if somebody's listening to this and they're going through a rough time or know somebody that is, what advice do you give somebody like somebody that's on the edge, you know, double action has been taken out and they're cocked back and they're like almost at that point, what do they do? They're about to make a permanent solution to a temporary condition. With every peak, there's a valley. And if you're looking for what to do and you don't know where else to go, come to one of the more jacked up people you'll ever meet in your life. Come find me. I'm very easily found. Everybody is allowed to come find you. Everybody. <laughs> I will not turn anybody away. And, and, and you know what, for as much craziness as I do get, I'll weed through that craziness in order to get to that one person that needs it. Yeah. You know, I'll, put, I'll put myself out there in order to do that. That's all I want. And if I don't, cause 
more than likely, I'm not going to know how to help you, but I get guarantee through the relationships that I have built, I'll get you to the right people. Wow, man. Thanks so much for being on the show. What a great conversation. I like to uh, feel that I can go around telling people that Kevin Donaldson's my friend now. Uh, so I don't know if you ever stop knew- bringing poop emojis out on stage after I get on there. Oh, that's never going to stop. Um, <laughs> But uh, you you now have, I don't know if this was part of your mission and your vision um, or just another thing you never thought would, would come to fruition, but you now have a friend named Dragon. Never thought that would happen. Thanks so much. And uh, thanks everybody for, uh, for spending time with us. Um, have a great day. Hmm. Makes sense.